Welcome to the 2022 um, George and uh, Rosalind House Distinguished Lecture in Geology. This um, lecture series is, was established in 2014. It's for the UMD Department of Geology to host a world leader in science for lectures here. After two years of hiatus, you all know due to the pandemic, we're very pleased to be able to come back again in person to hold this lecture. Today, it's my honor to introduce the speaker, uh, Dr. Sue Branley, who's sitting there. She's the Evan Pugh um, professor, university professor, and the Barnes uh, professor in geosciences at Penn State University. Sue got his uh, BA in um, chemistry, and then she got her master's and PhD in geological science and uh, geophysics, all in Princeton University. Sue is an internationally recognized leader in the field of uh, hydrogeochemistry. She studies the chemical, physical, and the biological processes that control the reactions among water, rock, gas, biota, and soil through field measurement, laboratory experiment, and model. She has an uncanny ability to actually build together to capture and integrate multimodal data sets at a different temporal as well as spatial scales to gain quantitative understanding of a complex natural systems. Together with his co-authors and uh, close collaborators, Arthur White, she coined the term Earth's weathering engine to describe the dynamic process of soil creation. Sue is a true visionary leader. Her vision and her leadership plays a key role in the successful establishment of the NSF funded critical zone science um, observatory network. She studies many aspects of the subsurface and surface processes, activities, both natural and anthropological. The economical and the environmental impacts of her research is far reaching. Her extraordinary contribution to science was widely recognized both nationally and internationally. Sue is an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences, an elected member of AAAS, a foreign member of the French Academy of Science, to name a few. And she is a fellow of many professional societies. Sue received the numerous medals and awards. I won't list the every, I, I listed this year, but I won't read all of them to save time. The most recent one is the Vanatsky Medal from the International Association of Geochemistry Society. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Sue Branley. I was telling people when I get home, I'm gonna tell my husband, well, where are you taking me to dinner tonight? It's been such a nice week and what an introduction. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, something I've been studying in Pennsylvania since about 2011, how fracking affects our water. And I'm gonna to try to give you um, kind of a nuanced view of it. I have kind of a nuanced view of it and hopefully by the end, I'll give you, you know, some take home messages but you'll see some of the complexities of you know, understanding uh, the processes of fracking and how it affects our water. But let me uh, first thank uh, Rosalind and uh, George who funded this distinguished lectureship. And you know, I think that probably their heart was in helping the University of Maryland by bringing someone here. But of course, um, spending the, the week here and getting to know so many people. This is my new favorite place. So it's a very reciprocal thing that you're doing by uh, bringing people in to get to know University of Maryland. So thank you for that. 
Um, so let's just start, you know, talking about uh, fracking. And it's important because uh, the, the term itself is a little bit confusing. So to the public, fracking includes um, like all the processes that petroleum engineers use to get shale oil and gas out of deep rocks. And to a petroleum engineer or to, to a geologist that knows something about it, fracking is the very specific process of uh, cracking a reservoir that has oil or gas, and in particular, an unconventional, an unconventional reservoir that is, uh, has very low permeability. And so by cracking it can allow the oil or gas to come out. And in particular, we've been doing that to rocks in the subsurface for a really long time, including some of the earliest oil and gas wells in Pennsylvania. They would put down like, you know, dynamite to crack it to try to get oil and gas up. So when people talk about fracking today, and especially when they're anti-fracking, let's just say, for example, they're usually talking about this new kind of high pressure, high volume hydraulic fracturing where a very large volume of water is pumped down into rock to fracture it. And when I say large volumes, I mean, it's, it's millions of gall gallons of water. So since about 2005, uh, these new techniques uh, have, have been used and it's allowed the USA to reduce uh, imports of oil by more than 50% and now to become a gas exporter. And people talk about this as the shale revolution, and it's really been a most a revolution in terms of energy, but also in terms of the economics, and really has implications worldwide. Although there hasn't always been as much success in some of the other shales around the world, there's a lot of experimentation in terms of figuring out, you know, how to make it happen in any given place. So in the Appalachian Basin, so this map you can see Pennsylvania and uh, Ohio and. You know, I think Maryland's on there, yes. And it cycles through. It'll start in 2004. It'll cycle back around. And you'll see the number of shale gas wells that have been drilled um, in the basin. And the reason I really like this slide is it goes from 2004 up to 2019. As you can see, the, the speed at which the, the drilling occurred and my state, Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia also, there's a lot of oil and gas development over the years, but this uh, amount of activity in such a short amount of time with this relatively new high pressure, high volume uh, uh, fracking approach really created a lot of, of public uh, pushback. And I put a couple things here that I think are interesting. You know, 45% of the US uh, gas is now this kind of gas out of these reservoirs that are very low uh, porosity and permeability. And Pennsylvania is the second in the US in producing natural gas. So given that you know, rapidity of development and given the fact that it is an industrial activity, you bring in all this equipment and you, you know, build a well pad and you're in the rural part of Pennsylvania or West Virginia or whatever, and there's going to be some problems and some mistakes. There were some problems and mistakes and there was a lot of, a lot of pushback, a lot of uh, public pushback. And uh, so the first shale gas well that was drilled in Pennsylvania was in 2004. Um, since that time, there's been more than like 4,000 complaints that were lodged to the Department of Environmental Protection um, over the next 12 years. And the most common problem in our state uh, and in this part of the uh, Appalachian Basin is natural gas getting into people's uh, water supplies. There were also 1,000 spills, more than 1,000 spills. I'll talk a little bit about what's being spilled. Uh, you know, 5,000 violations, most of which are somewhat, somewhat minor, but several of which were very major. And um, now in Pennsylvania, about a third of the domestic water wells are, are within two kilometers of a, of a fracked well. So, uh, a lot of celebrities got involved in the pushback. There was a movie Gasland, which you may have seen. Um, these, these are some, you know, some of the celebrities that started pushing back. And I, I think it's really kind of interesting that perhaps because of uh, sort of the furor in Pennsylvania, uh, it actually had impact around the world. And uh, this high volume, high pressure fracking was banned in parts of Australia and Canada, uh, Bulgaria, I think in Maryland here, it's still um, illegal, I think, um, parts of France and Germany. Uh, 
and it, you know, it's it's because of what happened really in the Appalachian Basin, I think. Um, now there were problems in other other areas as well. So it's also interesting from the point of view that in Pennsylvania, um, we're the state with the longest history of commercial hydrocarbon extraction. Um, it's alleged that the oldest commercial oil well was drilled at the Drake well, and I think it was 1859 in, in northeastern Pennsylvania. And we think that there's probably more than 500,000 oil and gas wells in the state. We don't know where all of them are, but we have a very long history, and yet there was all this uh, furor because of all the, the problems that, that happened and that you probably heard about. And you can see some of the images here. We're also the state that uh, has a lot of coal mining as well. So what, you know, what was actually new in 2004? What were they actually doing? And you know, what were some of the problems? So um, an oil well or a gas well is typically drilled vertically uh, into the subsurface as shown here. And uh, what they started doing uh, is they discovered that they could drill vertically and then bend the well and, and drill horizontally and stay right in a shale layer. And the shale rock, as the geologists in the room know, is where the, the oil and gas is, is generated. But uh, the oil and gas typically moves from the shale into a reservoir that has more porosity and more permeability. And that's what we had been targeting because it was easier to get out of the higher porosity, higher permeability rock. Shale has very low porosity, very little uh, connectivity between pores. So it's difficult to get the oil and gas out. And so what they started doing was drilling along a shale, uh, so along the, the long layer, and uh, then pumping down high pressure water into that uh, horizontal zone and in different segments of it, uh, putting, making the pressure so high that it would actually fracture the rock. And I'll show that in the next um, image. So these can be many miles into the subsurface and the horizontal leg can also be uh, miles along and they're getting longer and longer and they're putting more and more of these on a well pad so my grad student was telling me that in um, southeastern Pennsylvania there's a well pad that he thinks there's like 40 of these uh, wells in on the same well pad so the well pad being the footprint uh, at the at the surface so um, the other thing I wanted to say in this image here is that uh, they put down what's called casing, so steel tubing, and it's you know wider casing at the top and it gets narrower and narrower. And that is what keeps the water that's in the, in the rock separate from the oil and gas that's inside the well. And in between these casings, they put cement, and that's the secret that is supposed to keep the oil and gas separate from the water. So um, they, you know, sometimes case the entire well all the way down. And I'll tell you, I'll show you some examples later where they didn't do that always. Um, they did only the upper part through the, you know, typical couple, couple hundred meters or a couple hundred feet um, where the groundwater aquifers are, but uh, they can case it and cement it um, up and down the entire well. And that's the secret to keep the, keeping the oil and gas separate from uh, the drinking water. So this kind of shows you a little bit uh, more what it looks like. So this is a blow up of the horizontal part of the well and they uh, you know, pack off subsections of the well and then they actually use these high pressure you know, fluid volumes and with perforations and the perforations in the, in the casing here allows the high pressure fluid to get into the rock and then, and then you get the fractures extending out from, from the borehole. And part of the secret is they put sand in the water that they pump down there. And then the idea is that as the pressure opens the rock, fracks the rock, the sand gets out there and holds open the, the fracture. And so you see these sand boxes. This is a picture that I took on a site where they were, they were actually fracking. They, they made us get off before they actually fracked, but they were you know, in between fracking some of, some of their wells. And then this is what uh, sometimes they call these like the Christmas trees that you see at the wellheads where the, where the gas um, comes up. Huge amounts of water, sometimes they pump it in. There was, there's uh, been all sorts of pipelines across the state to move water around. Sometimes they're trucking it in. 
but you'll, you'll see big impoundments like this um, as well. So the average amount in Pennsylvania is at least 4 million gallons, but um, some of the, the longer um, horizontal legs means more water that they're using, they're using to frack. So to make this all happen, um, they play around with the chemical cocktail that they put down there. And you know they put all different kinds of chemicals in there and you can see some of them and what they're being used for. Um, they put in acids because that helps the fracturing happen. They put in some gels and some polymers because if you think about it, pumping down high pressure water, you know, miles into the subsurface, that takes energy. And so they put uh, chemicals, polymers to make it so it's like a slick water, so it's not as hard to, to pump it down. And then they, 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 you know, some of these chemicals are to move that sand out into, into the fractures. But they end up having to put things in to try to kill the bacteria because bacteria will grow. So they have biocides in there. Um, they have surfactants that um, are related to the, you know, you know the, the slick water and making it so that they can pump it down. And they don't always tell you everything that they put in there. Um, most states require that you have to publish it um, in frac focus online. But the, if you have a proprietary, proprietary compound, um, you don't always have to uh, reveal it in every state. So some of these are toxic. And uh, the public has been uh, kind of focused on these chemicals because of the, the toxin, toxic nature of them. And so that typically is what people have been most worried about is the, is the toxic compounds being pumped down you know, through the surface water that we drink and the groundwater that we drink as well. I like this image because it just you know, reminds you that we're talking about great depths. This is, so this is just Pennsylvania here over into Ohio. This is what a typical well pad might look like. I already showed you this, but um, it was red in the image that I showed you before. Uh, the water goes down and they you know, do, the, do the actual fracking and then they it's all closed off at the top because they need to maintain that pressure. And then they let it sit for a while and then they open it up to let the gas start to come out. And when the gas comes out, um, formation water that was in the rocks um, also starts coming up. And in almost all shales and sedimentary basins, the water that comes back up uh, becomes more and more salty with time because most formation water in these rocks are, are, are salty. So when the, when the gas comes up, it comes up with water and that has to be separated. And so that's what you see here. There is a separator here and then the, the brine is, is stored in these containment tanks on site, and then it has to be taken away. So when, you know, most people, when you talk about fracking, they worry about the compound, chemical compounds, they know about the chemical compounds. Very often they're not worried so much about this, this very salty water, but really the, you know, in my opinion, the, the bigger problem than the actual chemical compounds they're sending down is the large volumes of salty water, brine water that is coming back up and that is being collected at the, at the surface. So my friend Radisaw Vidic at the University of Pittsburgh has spent a lot of time studying this and you know, he's, he's an engineer, he thinks about it as a problem and what can you do with it. And you know, if you're interested, you can look at some of the different chemistry. Basically it's like up to 10, at least in the Pennsylvania, the Appalachian Basin, up to 10 times the concentration of seawater. So it's very, very salty. Um, mostly sodium chloride, which is the same salt in, in seawater. But uh, there's also a lot of strontium um, and barium, as well as magnesium, uh, calcium, you, know, you name it, uh, is in there. One of the things Radisov is interested in is there's also uh, radioactive elements in there, mostly radium. And um, the, the brines you know, in the country all have a little bit of radioactive elements, but the Appalachian brines are the most radioactive. Very small amount, but slightly radioactive. So um, this is just a you know, way too complicated plot to tell you about, but one of the things Radisov is interested in is you know, if gas production, if we, if we calculate it into the future and we think about this waste brine and what we do with it um, and how we take care of it, you know, what's it gonna, what are we gonna do into the future? And one of the things he's worried about is um, 
sometimes we are pulling out uh, some of the salts and getting the you know the radioactive waste in the salt and have solids that are then taken to some landfills. And so this was just a projection that as you think forward in time, what's going to happen to those wastes, that that's a problem that, that he's worried about. I think in my last slide, I forgot to mention what they do with it um, has varied. It, it varies around the country. It's varied over time. So in the old days in Pennsylvania, some of it was actually disposed on roads um, as a dust suppressant. Uh, the most common thing in the country is deep injection. They, they drill deep wells, or sometimes they use wells that have already been drilled and, and then pump it kilometers down into the subsurface. And that is either uh, regulated by the state or by the EPA. And in Pennsylvania, we didn't have any of these deep injection wells for this particular kind of waste. And so for a long time, we were trucking ours to Ohio and then uh, deep injecting in Ohio. But there are tens of thousands of these deep injection wells in the country as well. And this has been something that's been, you know, we've been doing for a very long time. Uh, the thing that we developed in the Appalachian Basin is recycling. So I think the latest is like 50% of the brines that come up in the Appalachian Basin, or at least in Pennsylvania, are now, are now used to frack new wells, which is a good thing because then it goes down and most of it isn't coming back up again. Um, so the, the, uh, you know, that's great now, but if you think in the future, you know, if we stop fracking, then we're, we're going to be still producing salt as long as we're producing gas from these wells, salty water as long as we're producing gas from these wells. So we can recycle now while we're fracking, but if we stop fracking, then we are going to have this salt, which is why my friend Radisson Vidic is, is looking at all these other options. Evaporation and sludge burial, you can evaporate and collect the salt, and then some of that sludge can be buried in landfills, as I've already mentioned. And then uh, some dilution and purification has been, has been used as well. Okay, so what are all the potential problems, or maybe not all of them, but some of the, some of the bigger ones? Uh, direct contamination from upward flowing liquids from the buried reservoir. This seems to be what the public was most interested or most worried about, you know, that we're gonna frack down there and then somehow this, you know, toxic waste is gonna get into the drinking water. So I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, emission of the gas, the natural gas has many different compounds in it. The most common one is methane. So sometimes I'll call it gas and sometimes I'll call it methane. But emission of gas into wells is also a problem. You produce methane in your body. You know, methane is not toxic, but if you have a leaking, you know, if leaking gas, methane is coming out of your water in your basement and it collects, that could become an explosion hazard. The other thing that can happen, and, and we've spent a lot of time looking at, is if methane goes into an aquifer, it can make it can uh, pull down the oxygen in the aquifer. So then you can start uh, moving some compounds that you may not want to move, like arsenic and some other things. Spills, leaks, leaching of drilling fluids. I'm not going to talk too much about drilling fluids. They do use fluids to to make the drilling work. Uh, leaking of these of the fracture fluids with the compounds. And then the, the probably the biggest fluid problem is these brines because there's so much of them. And this is all over the country, these brines uh, come back. And then the final thing, which hasn't been looked at very much, is the shale cutting. So you're drilling this far down, the, the, the pulverized rock actually comes back up. That's what we call the shale cuttings. And those have some radioactive elements in them. They're very, very low concentration. And those in Pennsylvania are buried in, in landfills. And it, haven't, it hasn't been studied that much. But I mean, I don't think that's a really big problem, but I think it's something that we need to, to look at. Then there's erosion problems. You know, this is very industrial, building these well pads all over, contamination from sediments. And then the problem that I'll talk a little bit about, too, interactions between new wells and old wells. I already mentioned we have like 500,000 of these old oil and gas wells. We don't know where they all are. And for you to go out and drill in any of these states, you have to find old wells in your area, but sometimes... Uh, Sometimes connections happen in the subsurface that are unexpected. So um, let's talk about direct contamination from upward flowing liquid, uh, you know, from the reservoir. This is extremely rare. Maybe it's never happened. You know, I've been in plenty of meetings where oil and gas uh, practitioners have said to me, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. See, that just never, ever happens. I think it, 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 in some senses, it's never happened. Out of zone fracturing, I don't think has ever happened. But um, in some cases where the field was very 
uh, was not very deep, so where, where the target was, was shallow, there have been connections from the subsurface up. So I think it, you know, from that point of view, it, it's, you know, it's of interest, but it's extremely rare. This is a, this is a figure that um, is shown very often. This is from a publication from the oil and gas industry where you can see um, this is a time, or not, sorry, no, this is distance away from the, um, the vertical well. And this is, you know, the, it's not exactly horizontal, that horizontal well, but this is showing uh, what they think is the depth of the fracturing away from the horizontal well. And then this shows you um, how, how separated it is from, from where the water is being extracted for the, for the drinking, drinking wells. And so there typically is, you know, miles between the water we're drinking and where these fractures are. But there have been some cases where the targets have been pretty shallow. Um, I'll show you the shallowest separation in Pennsylvania. But there are cases out there that you can find in the, in the literature. Um, it's very hard for me to get data for them, but I, you know, you can read about them where the target has been relatively shallow. And so there have been some problems with lacking of cement, um, sometimes communication with older wells, it's, there's blowouts sometimes. But this, these are the kinds of things that are very, very rare um, that, that have happened, but extremely rarely. The most common mechanism for shale gas waste to get into water resources, I think around the country, but also in Pennsylvania, are things like uh, the way we originally disposed of the waste early on was, was inadequate. So in Pennsylvania, they would put them into publicly owned treatment uh, facilities and then just dump them into the Allegheny River. And the publicly owned treatment facilities were not taking out all this salt because the salt is so soluble. You, you, know, you, you have to evaporate it to get the salt out and they weren't doing that. So this contaminated uh, Allegheny River. The EPA discovered there's a lot of bromide and there were some problems around that, that that reached the newspapers. So that was an early problem. Mostly spills on well pads and during trucking or injection, um, you know, trucking accidents, that kind of thing. Leaks from well pads. And then early on, they would, they would sometimes take this brine and just put it in impoundments like I'm showing up there. And leaks out of impoundments early on were, were problematic. And those were uh, more or less made illegal in 2011 and 2017. So really probably the most uh, common and problematic is just spills and leaks um, of, these, of these wastes. The graph shows a uh, number of wells sputted, that means started, you know, the drilling started. And so in the red uh, versus time, so 2005 to 2020, and then spills uh, over 500 gallons that I could get from the Pennsylvania uh, database. You can see it really tracks with the number of wells and then the number of fracked wells. Um, they'll drill and then sometimes the wells sit there for a while before they actually frack them. So, when people went out and started looking at water chemistry and looking for problems, you know, what you, you know, you're trying to show that there is a problem that you can directly, you know, associate with, uh, you know, fracking or drilling and that sort of thing. Most of the studies that do that don't find much effect. So I just list some here. I'm not going to go through them, but you can see in different, you know, parts of the country, they'll go out and they'll look at water. They just don't see much of an effect. Sometimes they'll see methane in water wells but they can look at the isotopes. So they look at the kind of carbon that's in there and they'll see that it looks like what we call biogenic carbon. And you know, any kind of swamp will have biogenic carbon. Swamp gas is, is it's a natural methane. So most of the studies that kind of you know, look at before and after and that sort of thing with uh, sort of like trying to find, uh, a, they look at a small number of sites and they do all the chemistry before and after, don't find problems typically. But as I've already said, you know, there's like 11,000 shale gas wells drilled. We heard about problems. Um, you know, there were spills. And so, you know, in 2011, you know, we were trying to figure out what can we do to try to find, um, you know, what's going on and how bad this problem is. So, you know, how do you find these problems if the, if the rate, uh, if the rate is, is so small that when you do studies like these, you don't, you don't find any problems. So what we did in 2011 was propose 
that we would try to you know, work together with the oil and gas industry, with other academics, with watershed groups, uh, consultants, and pull together water quality data for all over the basin. We ended up focusing mostly on Pennsylvania and publish it online and invite people to work together looking at data. And this was funded by National Science Foundation. And over time, we pulled together a lot of water quality data. And you can see this is a plot of, you know, number of data values up to like whatever it is, 2 million, 3 million from 2011 to 2022. And you can see where all these water uh, quality sites were around the state. And um, this is now being run by Tao Wen at Syracuse University. But we included data from, you know, pretty much anyone where we could um, assess that they had some uh, sort of quality control. And we put it online and we invited people to look at it together. Now, the problem is there's like 11,000 wells in Pennsylvania. And, you know, this looks like a lot of data, but we have, you know, thousands of miles of streams. And then we have groundwater in the subsurface. And the bottom line is, I, I don't think you could ever sample enough because if there is a spill or if there is an incident, you know, they usually stop it. You know, they don't let it keep going. And so you have a finite amount of time. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's very difficult to convince yourself that you'll ever find anything in a water quality database like this. We've looked very hard. Um, this is a paper that we wrote about uh, surface water data. And, you know, there was 1300 spills and we looked at all the surface water data stream, you know, and uh, river chemistry. And we only found, you know, 0.2 to 2% of them that we could actually see in the water quality database. Um, and so you could ask yourself why this is. I think there's a lot of reasons. I mean, one is, you know, monitoring is sparse compared to the 70,000 miles of streams. I mean, there's a lot of stream uh, in Pennsylvania. And everyone has reasons not to share their data. That's a big problem with data, you know, like this, um, including academics, including myself, right? You know, we would get data and we were publishing it online, but of course I was always trying to find the problems, you know, I was trying to, you know, see what was interesting in the data before we got it online. So I just want to own that no one likes to share data. It's difficult to share data. Um, the spills tended to be small. Most of the spills were small. There were some very, very large spills. They tended to be contained. There were some that were not contained. Um, probably, well, definitely spills were also diluted. It rains a lot in Pennsylvania. I brought a little Pennsylvania weather with me down here uh, for Monday through Wednesday. Um, you know, the, some of the material in the spills are biodegraded or, or obscured by um, other contaminants. But nonetheless, we kept putting the data online. And then just this last year, the year before, um, some economists from the from University of Chicago, Booth School of Economics, some very, very smart folks, pulled all the data together for the country, including you know, some of our data that we had put online, and did a national analysis using some uh, techniques that we didn't know about. We now, we're now working with them. We're now learning these techniques. And they looked across the entire country and they were able to show statistically that there are associations between uh, new hydrofract wells and slightly elevated salt concentrations in the same watershed surface waters. So they could explain 80 to 90% of some variations over time. And you know, if you look at their paper, they do this in all different kinds of, of statistical ways. They use, uh, fixed effects uh, regressions, but nationwide they saw extremely small effects, very, very small. So 0.004, you know, milligrams per liter bromide, 0.00, did I get all those zeros in there? Five milligrams per liter chloride. You wouldn't even taste this effect. This is very, very small per well, uh, you know, sort of statistically across the country. And they did all sorts of analysis and, um, you know, when this paper was put in review, it's published in Science. It's a really nice paper, I think. Uh, they sent it to me for review, and I kept, you know, saying, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? Because I didn't believe it at first. And they kept, you know, used this fixed effect uh, regression analysis that now we're also using. 
And they were able to show, I mean, they, they convinced me that there does seem to be an ever so slight increase in salt in our, in our surf, this is surface water, um, that seems to be associated with the, with the wells. And uh, they saw increases between 90 and 180 days after the spud date, so after the, the drilling was started. The average well um, is, is fracked 103 days after the spud date. So it's like seems to correlate with that. Um, increases are larger for wells with larger brine production. So some wells bring up more brine than others, so that they seem to see correlations with that. Increases are larger for wells in areas with higher salt concentrations in the waste. So different basins have different salt concentrations. And they use the local river chemistry as control. So that takes into account if there is natural brine coming up into the river, which does happen around the country, um, that should be taken into account because they used uh, the control. So I think, it, I think it's a beautiful paper. So that was surface water. Most of the data that we've gotten came because with our process of doing the shale network database, we started working uh, with the Department of Environmental Protection at Pennsylvania, and they started coming to their, we have an annual meeting that we do, and they we made an agreement with them that took a year to make an agreement between Penn State and the state of Pennsylvania, and they give us uh, the groundwater chemistry data that the oil and gas companies pay to have measured uh, before they drill to safeguard themselves if there is a problem. So before uh, the companies drill, they go out and sample like up to, you know, maybe a mile away, um, all the drinking water sources. And then they get that analyzed by a, a commercial analytical firm. And then they give all the data to the state and it was coming into the state on PDFs. And so they give it to us and I pay students to put it online, uh, which is the only way to get it online apparently. <laughs> and uh, so most of our data is for groundwater. And so we've started using the same fixed effect regressions that, that we learned from the economists. And we now can see that when you look at the groundwater, uh, you do see uh, slight increases in these salt concentrations that seem to correlate with these, with these oil and gas wells. Um, this is in the um, Southwest part of Pennsylvania. So, you know, Pittsburgh is right in here. This is one of the hot spots of the drilling. And we've only recently started looking at this because this is, you know, there's a lot of coal mining, uh, conventional oil and gas, and now these new unconventional oil and gas. And so this is sort of a hard place to separate out the different effects that might be going on. And my grad student, Sam Shaheen, now has published a paper on this. And he is also seeing increases in concentration in groundwater per, uh, this is unconventional oil and gas uh, development well, within a, within a kilometer. And these effects are um, sometimes like a thousand times larger than what you see in the surface water, which makes sense. You know, surface waters are being diluted all the time by all the rain. The groundwater is not being flushed very fast. So it does look like there is a very, very slight, this is a small effect um, that is putting salt into the waters that is related to um, the development. So what else happened with the network and the database? Well, we run workshops every year. We started working with a lot of different volunteers. We worked with Trout Unlimited and um, they helped us sample and we took them on field trips. We had that green stuff is a um, pretend spill that we did to teach them what the DEP does when, um, you know, when there is a spill. But, you know, what, what we got out of it was the volunteers led us to unplugged wells that they knew about and that we didn't know about. So some of these, these old wells that are in here. Um, they actually helped us do sampling. So they increased our sort of spatial sampling. They increased our knowledge of the landscape. Um, they led us to some modern leaking shale gas wells. So there were people that came to us with problems that we were able to study. And, uh, you know, we all ended up helping each other learn about, about these uh, systems. So this is just, you know, shows you some of the old oil and gas wells. This is one that's leaking. Uh, and that Tao Wen, who's now running the, um, the database, is collecting. He's a professor now at, at uh, Syracuse University. Um, and they also helped us find something that now we call gas leak discharge. All over Pennsylvania, there's something called acid mine drainage, which comes out of um, coal mines, the old coal mines that haven't been um, 
you know, ameliorated. Turns out with these, some of these old uh, leaking gas wells, enough methane comes out, pulls the oxygen out of the aquifer, that mobilizes some of the iron oxides, and then you start uh, getting what looks like acid mine drainage, but we call it gas uh, lake discharge, and that's Taiwan again. This is another place. This is a beautiful stream in central Pennsylvania. There, this is uh, within a kilometer of a new shale gas well, um, and it is experiencing a methane leak. This just sort of shows you what it looks like in cross section. Here's the well. This is the gas leak. And as it moved through, it started to um, reduce metals. So that would put metals into solution. It started sulfate reduction. You can see it. This is uh, chemistry versus time. You can see like the methane went up. Which one's methane? This one, here's the methane going up over time. And the first thing we saw is the iron and manganese went up. And then the, um, the sulfate uh, was reduced to, to H2S. So you see H2S. And what's kind of interesting is we were able to, because some uh, the people that lived here brought us in because their water wells were being affected, we could see it actually move. It's now, you know, in the next valley over where we're working with some farmers where we've seen some of it. So anyway, we have something like 30,000 stream and groundwater sites. This shows methane concentrations around the state. Uh, most of this is uh, natural methane, but there are some cases in here that you know, we've been able to show the best of our ability are related to the, you know, some local uh, drilling. Uh, some of these data, the, the uh, you, know, you can see some came from volunteer groups, some from uh, Pennsylvania DEP, some from uh, gas companies data as well. Um, I'm probably going to have to go skip some of this because it's getting late. Uh, because these, the water chemistry we get from the DEP has so many analytes, we actually have looked at, you know, calcium versus manganese versus barium versus manganese. And we can compare the, the samples that we think have methane, but it's natural methane. And we compare it to samples uh, that, okay, so this is natural high methane samples and natural low methane samples. And then if we plot the data and look at these other elements, what we end up seeing is some outliers that plot in the wrong part of the diagram. And that has been uh, something that has helped us now to say, when you see these high irons and you see this H2S and this certain kind of a signature, it's uh, indicating that that methane has entered that aquifer recently. It's not the methane that has been there for a very long amount of time. And so we could sort of see that on this, on this figure. We've done it around the country, looking at other aquifers. In other words, looking at the other elements and trying to figure out if uh, you can distinguish new methane, which is a leak, from old methane, which is natural. And we do see evidence for it. But interestingly enough, we see more incidents of this leaking methane in the Marcellus in Pennsylvania or in you know, the, the fields than we do in Texas and Colorado. And that led us to you know, wondering why are there more problems in Pennsylvania? And uh, so we now explore these data. I mean, we have a lot of data now. This is very unusual for groundwater data because it takes a long time to collect it. This is Bradford County, the other hot spot of drilling up in uh, Northeastern uh, Pennsylvania. And so now we're looking at these data and using um, sort of uh, geospatial techniques of sort of statistically looking at the chemistry of the data and how, how far water is from different geological features or from uh, gas wells and then trying to correlate whether, whether we see increases in methane in the water as you get close to specific features. So this particular map, uh, the darker colors are where water wells show higher methane near some of the new shale gas wells um, in Bradford County. And so right in here, it looks like there are some problems with, with the wells that, that we've highlighted here. Now, geology is very interesting. You know, we've got folds and faults, and the, the lines here are faults that are coming to the surface. Uh, the red lines um, are anticlines, you know, the, the folds, and then the blue lines are synclines, the troughs of the folds. And so we also started noticing that up in this part of Pennsylvania, there seems to be correlations with methane and some of this folding and, and faulting. So this figure shows you where water 
becomes more concentrated in natural gas and methane closer to an unconventional gas well, but uh, this is the same area, but we've, well, now the dark is where you see more methane in the water uh, closer as you get to one of these folds, one of these anticlines. And so you can see why, you know, it, it starts to get difficult to, to figure out natural, uh, you know, what was already there and what's related to the geology versus what, you know, what the, what the gas wells did. So this particular uh, folding and faulting also led us uh, to, to work with some people up in the northeastern part of Pennsylvania, where uh, a family, after um, drilling and fracking of a well two kilometers away, about a mile away, they started noticing that their water was coming up with this foam. And the DEP had gone there, sampled, and not been able to figure out what it was. So we were able to go in there and actually uh, run some analyses and, and show that this is a compound that the companies were using. They use it, I think, in fracking, but they also used it um, in a drilling fluid. And uh, we think that probably what was happening was it was coming from the, the drilling fluid. If you look at it, here is where those water samples were. So this is where the foam was coming up. Um, this is like two kilometers to the oil and gas wells, which are up in here. Only one of these wells was fracked before this problem happened. But before the foam got there, they also saw dissolved methane um, shoot up in their water. So it was very low, and then they started seeing uh, more methane after, after the, the drilling of the five wells and fracking of, of one of the wells. There is a, this is the Susquehanna River here. This is a LIDAR image, but this is the Susquehanna River. There's also bubbling gas coming up in the Susquehanna River. Well, what's going on? This is what we think. This is a, a fracture at the surface. So you can see it in the subsurface down here. Here's the, the five wells, the oil and gas, or the gas wells projected to the surface. Turns out they were drilling down to the Marcellus down here, very, very deep but there was uh, methane in the intermediate um, rock layers as well, which is very, very common all over Pennsylvania. And we think that this gas in the intermediate zone was getting into the fracture and then moving along the surface and ending up in these people's, in these people's wells. So this, uh, the DEP was, is, has been convinced now, these particular wells were drilled early and they weren't cased and cemented in that intermediate depth where those uh, where the gas is showing. So now in Pennsylvania, you have to do that um, intermediate casing at that intermediate depth. The other case I showed you this, the gas leak discharge with that beautiful stream. Uh, we went there, we worked with those folks. Um, this site here is over here. This is another one of those LIDAR images. Here's the gas well. This is the closest gas well, and I cannot prove that this gas well did this. It's drilled, and you can see the fold. This is a plunging uh, anticline, and uh, the um, you know the what we think is happening is because they drilled. This is a very very. This is the shallowest well into the Marcellus that I know of in Pennsylvania. This is a a, a map of the um, basically the tendency to fracture you know, because of this fold showing the much higher tendency to fracture at the, you know, at the nose of the fold here. And that's exactly where the gas is coming up, um, that you can see coming up here essentially um, in, into this stream and then also into some of the groundwater along that valley. So what are my conclusions? It's extremely rare that fracking itself affects the water supplies. Um, but the development does affect our water. From the data we see, there's a small fraction of wells that create problems, but there are hundreds of spills that have created some problems. Um, to quantify the frequency of, of, these, of these problems, really, you have to use statistics, you have to use geospatial techniques. Um, it's very difficult, difficult to go out and do a before and after study and actually find a problem because you would you know, be lucky to find a gas well that created a problem because there's not very many of the gas wells that seem to be creating the problems. To understand the causes really, you know, the geospatial, that doesn't tell you what happened. You have to go and do a case study and that's very time intensive and difficult. And we've only been invited in on two different cases. So that's why I only showed you two cases. 
Mostly they go into litigation and then the scientists can't go in and do the studies. The DEP can, but we, the public, never find out what happened. So to me, that's a real problem because you, know, you can't see the, you know, what's going on. I showed you a little bit that the geology really matters. And I showed you that some of the worst problems are in Pennsylvania and it's worse in the Northeast than it is in the Southwest in terms of the gas. So I really have to close down, but I, you know, having told you, you know, I'm trying to give you this message that the number of problems compared to the number of shale gas wells is, is really quite small, but there's also a lot of health studies going on. And um, many studies are now coming out showing some linkage between health effects for people nearby um, asthma, headaches, uh, low birth weights with babies, leukemia, some other cancers. And most of these are correlations. They're showing correlations. So the, you know, the, the you know, asthma rate goes up you know, with the number of gas wells in your location. Um, and mostly the buffer size. So how close is usually like 10 kilometers. They're saying the asthma rate goes up within 10 kilometers. Jim Sayers at Yale now has done some studies trying to figure out how far could you really expect a problem to move, and it's about two kilometers in his studies for Pennsylvania. And that's what we saw in that one study that I showed you. Um, this is about the one of the really nice studies that's just come out. There, if you just look at the red, they're saying that our results indicate exposure may be a, an important risk factor for ALL, which is a particular kind of leukemia, childhood leukemia, for children that are exposed. And um, you know, they did all sorts of studies to try to statistical tests. And they really uh, are finding some statistical um, evidence that there are health effects associated. But of course, what is causing it? And that's what we don't know. There's like a correlation, but what is causing it? You know, I talked about water, but there's drilling, there's fracking, there's waste transport, waste injection, there's pipelines. You can see all the pipelines across Pennsylvania, uh, truck traffic, um, you know, I, the, the betting right now is that if there is a health effect, which it kind of looks like there could be, um, that it's probably related to air. And I listed some of the hazardous air pollutants uh, that have been reported by the industry. And so uh, the Health Effects uh, Institute is, is funding, putting a lot of money into funding more sort of air chemistry studies and a little bit of funding now into water chemistry studies to look at this kind of approach. If it is from the water, what might it be? And I, I'm just you know, taking you back down to the Southwest Pennsylvania again, the study with uh, my student, Sam Shaheen. So Pittsburgh's down in here. It's the same kind of study I'm sh you know, plot I've showed before. This is for gas, so methane getting into groundwater. This is for um, fluoride getting into groundwater. And he identifies some hot spots where, uh, he can really, you know, see some evidence that there's higher chloride in those hot spots. And um, if you think that that chloride that has been identified in the groundwater is from brine and in those hot spots, and if you say, okay, I know what the average brine in Pennsylvania is, and if you look at all the trace elements in there and say, you know, I know what the ratio of trace element is to chloride, and then I'm going to, I know how much chloride got into the people's water and then calculate how much thallium and how much arsenic got into their water. In some of those hot spots, uh, thallium could be above uh, the EPA limit and arsenic can approach the EPA limit, but it's never been uh, measured to be that. This is just a calculation based on chloride. So if it is water, what I would think would be, it could be uh, thallium or arsenic um, and only in a few hotspots, what I expected to be able to see it. Okay, I think that's all. Um, we have found from this groundwater chemistry that sometimes the groundwater in Pennsylvania has actually gotten better, you know, over the same time period. I don't think the shale gas development caused that. I think it's because the acid rain has gone down. The acid rain has gone down because we're, we're burning less coal. And we're burning less coal because we're, at least partly, because we're burning more methane, which is cleaner. And Jeremy Weber at the at, uh, um, University of Pittsburgh is an economist. He's worked out, you know, he's looked at the economics of it. And, you know, he likes to emphasize 
that there is money going into these communities. There's certainly money going into Pennsylvania from this and uh, the natural gas was getting cheaper. And switching from coal to natural gas, not only means less sulfur going into the air and less acid rain, it also means less CO2 is going into there. This is the CO2 versus time measured um, you know, in Hawaii. And it turns out that when you burn coal, the amount of CO2 that goes into the atmosphere per unit of heat is higher than when you burn natural gas. And so it's pretty clear that you release less uh, CO2 into the atmosphere burning natural gas than burning coal, you know, for the same amount of heat. The bugaboo with methane and natural gas is that the natural gas leaks and uh, natural gas is also a greenhouse gas. And so there is a big argument about how much leakage of methane is there and does that, you know, uh, like counteract, you know, the fact that the CO2, you're putting less CO2 out. So I think the, you know, people that I know that have looked at the latest data still think that it's slightly better to, uh, to burn the natural gas. There's less CO2 um, that's being produced. It's certainly better to burn natural gas from the point of view of less uh, uh, contaminants going into the air, natural gas versus coal. So we've moved, oh, you know, these are the same conclusions I had before. And I just wanted to, you know, point out shale gas moved us away from coal, which is a really good thing. And um, it's now having large ramification in the energy war that we're in. You know, the fact that we're exporting natural gas is going to help whatever's going to happen in Europe, um, you know, because Russia has, has shut down the, the gas pipelines. So this is important too. And, uh, we do, though, have to stop digging up carbon from beneath our feet and putting it into the atmosphere, which is what hydrocarbon uh, burning is doing. And there's a lot of things that we need to demand that aren't technical at all. You know, we need public dissemination of groundwater chemistry. It shouldn't be so hard for me to, to get the chemistry and put it out there. Um, we need when there's incidents. I don't understand when an airplane goes down, why we all get the black box and we have a public discussion of what happened. But these incidents, you know, no one can find out about them. They go into litigation, you can't get the data. The two studies that I showed you, incidents, you know, one of them, the homeowners required that all the data go public. The other one, we actually worked with the homeowners. Um, we need more public involvement in all of this. And, uh, you know, demands that water chemistry be monitored and be public. Um, we need slower build outs with these new technologies, you know, this is an interesting industry in that it's a distributed industry. You know, if you make one factory in one place, that's one thing. But if you have, you know, we have them over half the, half the state in Pennsylvania. And we need honest brokers and funding so that scientists can go out and do this stuff. Because a lot of people, the first thing they ask you is, where'd you get your money? You know, and if you got it from one side or the other, they either believe you or they don't. Um, and I just think we need more dialogue about this because it's not all bad and it's not all good. Um, I think that, you know, the contamination from, of water is perhaps not bad enough to shut down what we're doing. Uh, but I am worried about a lot of other things like all that carbon that we're putting in the atmosphere. Um, and I am worried about the fact that there are finding these health effects and that's something that we need to understand much more. So that's what I have to say. Thank you very much. And I went a little long, I'm sorry. No, questions. Nick. So one person's trash. All right, I'll ask the question on the mic. One person's trash is another person's treasure, is sort of the, the mantra in the resource community, right? Um, I mean, natural gas was burned off as a waste product of oil production for many decades, if not a century. And now we're going to this as a an alternative source of energy. Is there a way for us to harness all those brines and things that are coming out of the ground and turning them into a resource rather than just throwing them away into the environment and in the um, There's landfills? a lot of people looking at that and a lot of people trying to do it. And there's companies that are trying to do it as well. So, um, you know, there's uh, lithium in there, 
you know, and we need lithium. Um, there's a lot, I mean, there's just about everything in there. So the question is, you know, can we store the waste? Can we get it out in a safe way um, and, you know, keep people safe? So people are trying that. Um, they used it for dust suppression in parts of Pennsylvania and that they've made uh, illegal. Now that doesn't seem like the greatest idea. We've never been able to see it in our water chemistry data though. You know what I mean? When we look around where they're doing the dust spreading, the dust suppression, we never see it in the groundwater and the, and the surface water. Um, I know a company that's been trying to uh, get the salt to, for use in you know, products, you know, the kinds of like de-icing products or you know, things in swimming pools. You know, people are trying to do all sorts of things. Um, probably that's going to happen because there's a lot of this waste that's coming back up. Thank you. Bed. Uh, great talk. Uh, I, have, I have questions where I feel like I'm a little embarrassed because I may have missed something. Um, so let me ask no, that one you first. missed one of my comments. Yeah. I, I, um, okay. So when you find this evidence of this very small amount of groundwater contamination, this is drinking water that people drink, right? What is the path? Is the pathway for that the kind of the water that comes out to the surface somehow leaks and gets in the groundwater, or is it somehow traveling out the well? That's it, because I, I don't. Oh, know okay. The, I don't know the answer. Yeah, I was like, like "What I mean, should be a slide that explains?" Yeah, I know, I know. I, I to my students, I'll say, "You know, there's like the, you know, it's the elephant in the room that you leave out, and you're not supposed to do that." Well, I don't know the answer though. I mean, we've only recently, you know, they only finally convinced me. You know, the data shows that there's a slight increase in the surface water, the, the salt content in the surface water that really does correlate with the with these gas wells. And then my student, Sam, has just been doing this great work recently convincing us that, you know, there's this little bit of salt. And we thought it probably had to be the spills because that pretty much is what people think is the main pathway. But um, I'm not I'm not sure. You know, there might be there might be leakage, you know, into the subsurface out of the wells along the boreholes. I'm not sure. Can um, we use like geophysics to figure it out? Like, yeah, we can. We need geophysicists. <laughs> like this, ERT maybe. You can, if ERT. you have brines, you should do oh, oh, resistivity. Yeah. Well, um, of course, you know, fresh water, you know, is in the upper, you know, several hundred feet, and then it starts to get briny naturally. So, you know, everything is complex geologically, right? And some of that natural brine is coming up, like we see uh, brine seeping into streams and things in, in Pennsylvania. So, you know, it's it, it's tricky. It's not it's not completely easy. And I'm not sure I'm not sure how we're going to figure it out. But um, you know, we're now seeing an effect that's there, but it's very very small, very small. Thank you. Nice talk. Uh, I have a question. If an incident happens or when they are doing the drilling, uh, how long it takes for the response time? Like how fast you are going to see the contamination and how long it stays? Like how is the lifetime of those contamination in the underground water or the surface water? That's a good question. Well, okay, so you know, it depends what the contamination is, what, you know, what's going on. But a lot of times the first thing that they see is natural gas getting into their domestic water wells. And that can actually happen pretty fast. So, you know, it, it, you know it, it's pressure that's moving it along. And, and uh, so sometimes within, well, actually that one figure I showed, you know, within, you know, days or weeks, they started, you know, they start to see uh, natural gas in their wells. Um, so then what they do is they call the Department of Environmental Protection and they, well, or, or else they go down the, and talk to the oil and gas guys that are drilling nearby or if they know where they are. Um, but then they come out and they start sampling and, and studying it. And then, of course, the problem is there's so much natural gas already in water wells, in people's water wells throughout Pennsylvania. One of the early uh, studies I showed you is something like, I forget what it is now, um, I don't know, 40% of 
of water wells, people's water wells already have natural gas in them before any of this happened. Um, and so, you know, the gas company isn't going to automatically think it's their fault. And so the DEP then has to start studying it. And then, you know, the gas company will start working with the DEP to try to get it to stop. And um, what they did in that one case, the case where there was white foam everywhere, they had to do what's called a cement squeeze where they pump a whole bunch of cement down the annular annulus between the, the casing to try to see if they could get it to finally stop. Um, now, does the methane automatically go away? Not necessarily, it depends how much went into the aquifer and how long it takes to, to come back out. So that particular case with the white foam, the gas company um, bought, bought up the people's houses, a beautiful house in a beautiful valley. You know, they were, you know, they just loved their place where they were and they, had, they sold their, you know, that was after litigation and they sold their house. Um, and now we can't go there anymore. We were going there while they owned that house. Now we can't go there and, you know, presumably the gas company made the problem go away, but, you know, I don't know. Um, but there are cases, some cases where they have a lot, of, they have a lot of trouble making the problem go away. Um, and that, those are the houses that you hear, hear about. And in fact, I always emphasize that the number of problems, you know, is pretty small compared to the number of shale gas wells. But I also like to emphasize that each one of those problems is somebody's family living in a house, drinking water, you know, loving their house, and then they can't drink it anymore, you know, unless they fix it. Like sometimes they can't fix it. Um, but, you know, it's hard. Um, quick question. I saw that um, there are a bunch of variables you were using to sort of trace groundwater leak, or sorry, well leaks. Um, and there are two that were missing. Um, and I'm kind of curious, do you have any attempts or um, any plans to measure them? The first being um, radioactive species and the second being water temperatures. Um, okay, so radioactive species, you know, I, I haven't measured that. People have done that. There, there are people that, you know, have been looking at that and trying to see if they see any. Um, there's radioactive elements in the brines. Um, I don't know anybody that has, di di uh, has measured, you know, radioactive element concentrations that have been, um, you know, diagnosed as having been caused by an oil gas well. I don't think I know of any case like that. Um, Yeah, George is asking about radon, and there is a health study that's talking about how the radon that's coming up, even in, you know, people's homes when they're just bringing the gas in to burn it, right? So, yeah, I mean, I think, I think radon, yeah, I was talking mostly about radium, right? I should have mentioned radon, which is a gas and a radioactive gas, and I think there could be health effects for that, but I, I haven't seen too many studies of that um, other than the basic ones in groundwater, radon in groundwater. Thank, thank you, Sue. Nice talk. Um, following up on Nick's question about uh, the brines being natural resources. Uh, and uh, I mean, this is the purview of the U.S. Geological Survey. And we, we just heard from the new director uh, of the new USGS uh, just last week at the uh, Cosmos Club. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, and maybe somebody could answer, but is, uh, are these brines considered natural resources that the USGS uh, uh, should be concerned about to uh, evaluate uh, or you know, resources going forward. I'm not sure I understand the question. You mean like they are a natural resource? And... How does the USGS treat them uh, in their in their resource uh, estimation? Because they have, they have a systematic resource estimation every few years. That's, that's well, I, don't, I guess I can't. I don't know what a resource estimation is exactly from the way you're talking about it. I mean, I know how they do it with hydrocarbons and that sort of thing. I don't, I don't know that they do that. Well, they have a produced water database that's run by the USGS that's wonderful, that documents all the chemistry of the brines that are coming up around the country, and it's a great resource. And that's how we were able to figure out how much thallium or arsenic could be coming up in some of the um, hotspot locations in Pennsylvania. Yeah. 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 Well, and I should also say, it's, you know, a lot of the USGS surface water data that we're also using in that, you know, in the studies when we're looking for effects. 
Thank you for the talk. I've really enjoyed learning from you this week. Um, one of the things that really struck me was how you, it seems like you've worked with a really large different amount of groups on this project, especially volunteer groups. And so I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on what it's like to build these relationships with the volunteer groups, especially on such a hot button topic. Um, well, I really enjoyed doing that. We just reached out to a lot of watershed groups. I worked with Julie Vestine at Dickinson College in Pennsylvania. And she had a lot of watershed groups that she worked with and she was training them how to sample waters and that sort of thing. So she had a lot of relationships. And probably if I'd come in from Penn State and said, you know, hi, I'm from Penn State, you know, start working with me, it maybe wouldn't have gone so well, but I worked with somebody that was working with the watershed groups. And so they were, you know, interested in interacting with us. So in the beginning of our, we, we hold this workshop every year at Penn State. And um, now Jennifer Baca, who's a professor or assistant professor in geography is taking those over. But um, in the beginning, a lot of these watershed groups were coming to our workshops and um, not as much anymore because there, it's not as much of a hot button issue anymore. And so, um, it was, you know, I liked working with the watershed groups. It, it's difficult because, you know, like my time is limited when I go in the field and my students and, you know, think about a, a you know somebody that's a housewife or you know a lawyer or something how much time do they have to go in the field so you know it's it's difficult you know it's not as it's not like working with grad students or you know <laughs> consultants or something that are paid to be in the field it's very rewarding um, and there were things that we learned uh, that we wouldn't have learned otherwise um, so does that answer your question and then we would always try to go back out and give talks with, to their groups and that sort of thing. But again, you know, it's just hard because, you know, you prepare a talk to go talk about their water and their, you know, and it's on a Wednesday night and all of a sudden it turns out, oh, it's back to school night that night or something. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's a different kettle of fish than what we're trained to do as academics. And, and I think we need to do more of it because we need the public to be more engaged. Um, but it's hard. Thank you as well for the wonderful talk. Um, oh, sorry. Thanks for the for the great talk. Um, I you mentioned that one of the reasons you may not be seeing the signature in the water is because of the amount of rainfall and like this kind of dilution of the signature. And I was wondering if you knew if um, like out west, like it looked like there was a lot of data in in Colorado. If in these drier areas, you see more of a signature. Okay, so the question if you know if there's more effect in the drier areas. So the national study that um, I showed from uh, Bonetti et al, uh, they were using data all over the country that they could get a hold of. Um, the really the three states where there's a lot of water quality data, and there's also oil and gas data. It's pretty easy. Are Pennsylvania, Colorado, and Texas. Um, we're trying to um, uh, work with some people that are going to try to get New Mexico data, New Mexico data. Um, but, you know, the, the effects that we see seem worse in Pennsylvania than out in the West, even though it's drier out there. But I just want to put in a plug that those three states, mostly it's Colorado and Pennsylvania, they're putting their data online. Pennsylvania, you know, everybody likes to beat up on Pennsylvania, myself included sometimes. Um, Pennsylvania is doing a really pretty, pretty good job of getting their data online, and the other states are not. Um, and Colorado is doing a really good job. It's hard to find water chemistry data and some of the oil and gas data uh, for Texas. All the violations are going online in Pennsylvania. You can look at every single violation online. Um, they're doing a pretty good job. And anybody that's done any data management and data publication online, it's not that easy to do in a way that, you know, other people can get in and understand what that data it costs a lot of money. You know, you have to have people that know the cyber stuff to be able to do it. And, you know, this is an agency that all, you know, was kind of regulating the conventional oil and gas industry, which was still drilling in Pennsylvania, but at kind of a lackadaisical rate. I probably shouldn't say it that way, but, you know, they weren't drilling very fast. And then all of a sudden they're drilling all those wells and they didn't, you know, hire, they didn't have enough money to hire all sorts of new people in, you know, they're putting their people out in the field, trying to keep up with the, you know, the oil and gas drilling that was happening. And they're trying to get their data online. You see what I'm trying to say? Like, I don't know this, you know, we have to demand it 
that the data goes online and that there's more data collection and all the rest of it, but it's just not that easy. We have to recognize that too. Hi, uh, thank you for this talk. It was really interesting and eye-opening. This might, I don't know how much you have to say on the topic of more of like the public um, perception of fracking and whatnot, but you did kind of keep mentioning how it's not as hot of a topic or a controversy anymore. Um, so I was just wondering if you, it, do you think if that's just from general fatigue that people have when it comes to issues that are social or do you, do you think there's actually more information out there about fracking or like, do you have an idea of like why that may be? Um, I guess, I guess, you know, I can talk about it. It's not something I know that much about. It's like more of a social science question, but, um, you know, it was new. People understand it a little bit more. I think people have opinions about it. You know, most, most people have an opinion about fracking now. Um, it's not in the newspaper as much. You know, I used to collect all the newspaper articles that were happening. You just don't read about it as much. Um, there's new contaminants that people are worried about, like PFAS and the, you know, perfluorinated compounds. Um, and in a way that, like, you know, people start worrying about a new thing and they don't worry about the old thing. Um, somebody I was talking to here, one of the things that we kept finding is we'd go out and we would see, oh, you know, evidence of coal mining on the, in the groundwater or the stream water. Well, that's been going on for a long time. So people don't seem to be as worried about that. You know, they're worried about this new thing. There's something to do with a new, a new problem, a new thing that we didn't know about. And then we somehow get used to it. And now it's, now, now it's PFAS. Everybody's worried about PFAS. And there is some PFAS in some of these um, fracking fluids, so they're getting interested again. <laughs> I don't know if that's an answer, but I'm not a social scientist, so I'm not the best person to answer that. Yeah. Hi, Sue. So um, I was wondering about two things. One is that um, you guys have probably already done this, but when you have you guys looked at, uh, you know, when you were saying that the concentrations changed a little bit, have you guys looked at the the chemical cocktail or the mixture before and after, like when they, when they did the fracking, like the, like multivariate kind of just like how the relationships with the elements might've changed, um, you know, before and after the fracking or the reason why I'm asking that is because you mentioned, you showed what was in the fracking fluid and all those different elements. And I just wonder if the, if there's like a signature of it, like when you look at multiple elements and then the other thing I was wondering is that, if you go away from the fracking site, there's some attenuation or dilution and do certain elements kind of fall out? Like what happens along the flow path of like a, a fracking leak, you know? Does that, does that make sense to you? Yeah. I well, okay, so uh, what was the you could two questions? What was the first one again? I've already first one is, have you looked at like uh, oh, a chemical oh, cocktail? Cool. Okay. Like, like well, the, okay, so the you're talking about a chemical cocktail, like the elements in the fracking compounds? Like if you did a straight up like PCA, right? I was just reviewing Carly's thesis paper where we do this for streams. If you did a straight up PCA of the, you know, the elemental concentrations before, like they they were looking at the, I can't, I think they were looking at like before and then after the wells were put in and the concentrations. If you looked at the, um, if you did a PCA of the concentrations of the elements before and then after, would they, would there be a difference, you know, in those mixtures? That's okay, so um, the people that did before and after studies, I don't know that I can tell you that they didn't do PCA, but I don't, I don't remember anybody where they did that kind of a statistical approach. I've never done a before and after. You know, we've been going out and trying to, trying to find the problems and then where there are problems, look at those problems. Now, where there was a problem, you know, we, we definitely used every element we could and looked for, try to, you know, do things like PCA, not exactly, we did machine learning things, but, you know, looking for signatures. And that's partly how we figured out, you know, that, you know, you, you see the iron come out first and then you see, um, you know, the sulfide come out. And we've seen that in the, in that particular farm field, we saw it in the stream. And then the next farm field, the next valley over is a farm field. And we've seen some, you know, evidence that it's, it's moving in that direction, but, um, you know, to do a PCA before and after, um, that we haven't done. And I don't know anybody that's done that. Maybe, maybe the Yale group, Jim Sayers might've done that because they, 
they had published one of those studies up there, but you know, pretty much the before and after people tend to not find anything. Yeah, or like distance away from the site or something just to see how it might, yeah, it just. Well, I mean, in effect, we, I didn't talk about it, but we do this machine learning, this kind of geospatial thing where we move a window across our groundwater chemistry and then calculate statistically whether the groundwater is, is increasing uh, closer to a shale gas well. And then we move it across the, and then, you know, those hot spot maps, the red and black maps were, were that approach. So that's kind of like that. And we've done that trying to look at different, different species and that sort of thing. But there's probably more things like that to be done. There's, there's a lot of data there. We certainly haven't done all the things that could be done. We have repeat questions. I have a question that you, you've worked with the public, members of the public, um, government agencies. Have you found anybody in industry who's interested in basically trying to find ways if leaks are happening, spills are happening, how to prevent this and maybe use some of the, the insight that you've been doing with, through your work with your, your group to make sure that they can identify problems where they crop up and mitigate them and do the kind of monitoring that's necessary to, to know if they're responsible for a spill and actually clean it up before it becomes a problem for the local community. Yeah, so um, when I first started talking about this, I was told by some people in meetings from the oil and gas industry that I didn't know what I was talking about and I was really shut down. That's happened a couple of times. Over the years, you know, as I learned more and I interacted with more people, I've met great people in the industry and generally industry does not want to have problems. They do not want to create problems. They do not want to contaminate people's water. And, you know, the way this works, you know, some of the companies in the beginning where there were the most problems, like if you think of uh, Dimmick, most people know a little bit about Dimmick because of Gasland, that was a smaller company. And it was some of the first times they were trying this and there were some problems with what they were doing. Then as the bigger companies came in, they really, uh, I, I think, you know, raised the, the level. Uh, the DP also started changing some of the rules. You know, I try to emphasize that as well. But um, I have worked with people in the oil and gas industry that would come to our meetings, our shale network meetings, and they're great. You know, they, they want uh, to keep the water clean. They want to share their data. They're often not allowed to share their data because of the lawyers telling them that they don't want them to share the data. So there's just all these embedded problems in there. But there are plenty of really good people in the oil and gas industry that want to keep uh, the water clean. Um, in the beginning, we could get watershed groups to come to Shell Network, but we had a very hard time getting oil and gas people to come. And that's because they would get beat up in the public sphere. And we got some to start coming. And then it became harder to get the watershed groups to come because it then kind of fell off the, you know, the radar or whatever. Um, so I don't know. I don't see the oil and gas industry as, as huge villains. Actually, you know, we're the villains because we want the gas and we want the energy. And every single one of you wants to be in a warm house and wants to drive somewhere and fly somewhere. Like we have to take responsibility too. So, I mean, I do think there are some bad actors out there. Do not get me wrong about that. But I think in general, they, they're trying to clean up their act. And, um, well, many of them are anyway. Uh, so. Um, kind of building on that or along a similar kind of line, I guess. I, I have a question about kind of what we as the scientific community do wrong in the sense that Okay, so now it's 2022, we're 10 years later, or longer, 14 years later, right, or 16 years later. Um, and when, when, when fracking was first taking place, and we were, you know, transitioning to gas as the interim fuel for our society, we were told we're doing this because the carbon cost of burning gas is much lower. And, and then maybe we all should have known better and started talking about leaks, but it's only now that we see these numbers that are like, oh, oops, we were actually leaking just as much. We might as well have been burning coal, um, at least as far as carbon's concerned, right? 
It could be, you know, coal is worse. Still, I think natural gas is still slightly better, you know. Yeah, but, but if you had told someone it's like 90% of coal, you probably would have been like, no, thank you. But okay, fine. Coal also emits mercury and other things into the air. So, yeah. so I'm not saying yeah. we should burn coal, but th there's that. And then I remember before that, we were all excited as a community. Oh, biofuels, we're going to have but like bioethanol, and that's even worse than gas. And so in terms of carbon. So what, like, what are we, are we just dumb? Like, how do we keep falling for this over and over again? And, and something so obvious, like we're geologists, we know that every, every rock is cracked everywhere. And we're surprised that methane is leaking up through the ground, you know, like, should we have known, or if we did not know, should, did we need some observational abilities that we didn't have? What should we learn from these mistakes that, these are not your mistakes. These are kind of big picture. I don't know. That's an interesting question. I, I, obviously, I'm not going to know any answer to that. Um, let me not quite answer the question, but say something else that I've thought about. And that is that, um, you know, a lot of us like to get National Science Foundation funding. You know, National Science Foundation doesn't really want to fund this area. You know, this is a really important thing for scientists to be studying. And that, that you know, our main you know, blue sky funding agency doesn't really want to fund this, you know? Well, what, you know, why is that? Well, some of it's because scientists, like we decide what's important, you know, and what, what, when we do our peer review, what other people should do. And we don't tend to, you know, throw money at problems like this. And so, you know, right now, like, this is going to relate to what I was just saying, but let me just segue a little bit. Right now, there's a lot of people trying to figure out how much methane is leaking because it's a natural, it's a greenhouse gas. And if it's leaking way more than, you know, the amount of CO2, you know, it's going to take, take up this benefit that we're supposed to get from natural gas. Well, why do we know so much more about that now? It's partly because Environmental Defense Fund has put a whole bunch of money out there and got a bunch of scientists to work together on that problem. You know, why did it have to be EDF? You know, why wasn't it, why wasn't it DOE? Why wasn't it NSF? I, I don't really know. But, you know, we're the scientists in the room and we're not demanding it either. You know, I think it's really interesting that it was EDF that really the, the studies that you guys have probably read about, like, you know, how much methane is leaking. A lot of it was pushed by EDF. And I, I don't know, you know, maybe we need to, to stop doing like, you know, I'm an aqueous geochemist. I like to measure these crazy little things that my friends like and we write our papers about and yeah, you know, like we're all like this, right? These little things that are so interesting, you know, but but we don't necessarily work on the big problems that our country needs sometimes. So I'm not answering your question, Ben, but but these vision statements, you know, where we say what are the important problems and no one thought to say how much methane is leaking out now that we're cracking the ground. It's kind of shocking. Well, it's also a cacophony, you know, like the, the one right now that you can talk about is, you know, carbon sequestration, geological carbon sequestration, you know, we've thrown a lot of money at that. And, you know, apparently we're going to do it in some places, you know, and there's just a lot of words thrown around that, you know, I'm not sure that we're going to do it very much, you know, we're not going to be pumping CO2 all over the place, I don't think, you know, so there's, you know, it's just hard, there's a, such a big you know, there's so much words out there about all this stuff, and it doesn't always make sense, you know? So I don't know. I don't know the answers. Okay. I, if there's no other question, I want to ask one last question, <laughs> which is different. That it seemed to me that we still need the natural gas. We need that energy. We can energy guzzlers. But uh, so the largest problem seemed to be we have to use water, large volume of water to fracking. Is it, because I, I have heard before that there are waterless uh, fracking techniques trying to develop. Have you heard more development in that front? Waterless fracking? Um, only, you know, I've heard of them using CO2 and things like that, but uh, not very much. I mean, there's such big volumes, you know, water is the cheapest thing to pump down there, really. So. I don't know too much about that. Um, you know, I think my bias too in Pennsylvania, we have so much water, you know, it's the amount of water that we're using to frack is tiny compared to the water we're using for other things. Um, so I haven't worried about that as much, but I think out West, that's probably something that people are probably thinking about more than I have. 
All right, let's give Sue another. Thank you.